And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now let me pause there just real quick. Missiologists have looked at the scripture and they've kind of framed it like this. Jerusalem is here. Judea is the community next door. Samaria is that wonderful community that needs help in unique ways that's in the margins. The last, the least, the lost, the poor, if you will. And then everywhere. And so for the church, Bakersfield right here, Southwest Christian Center would be our Jerusalem. Uh, if you look next door, uh, maybe as far as Los Angeles, but maybe like Oildale or Arvin or Lamont or Stockdale or Fresno where I live. And then Samaria, the hurting, the broken, the wounded, the homeless. And then everywhere. If you look on this wall right here in the back where it says, SCC Information Center, you can see World Missions is highlighted right there all over the world. And so every church should communicate Jesus in these four places, is the thinking there. And Jesus is communicating right here, I'm giving you power to do that. Amen. Everybody say power. power. Then in verse 9 and following, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We pray your anointing on your message. We thank you for Dr. Bob Proctor, Linda Proctor, these pastors, these ministers of the gospel. We pray your anointing on them today. And God, we pray today for this church, and we pray that you would engage us, inspire us, energize us, to turn the world upside down in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 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 All over our culture and all over the world, people in crisis will pick up a phone, grab a cell phone, and dial three numbers into the phone. Some countries that number might be 999, but for our United States of America, that number that's very familiar is 911. We dial it for emergencies. We dial it for crisis. If there is an accident on the highway, we dial the number. If there is trouble in the house where somebody has fallen and cannot get up, we dial that number. It is a number that sometimes is abused and misused. There are stories about people dialing the number 911 to order pizza. To ask weird, strange questions of people. But the number is there and the system is there for emergencies and help to help people in crisis and in challenge. But sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging. But there is a number I want to refer to you that I give you. It oftentimes we preach sermons in the church and we go through life and I've asked people who have heard me preach before, what did you think of the sermon last Sunday? And if I wait until Wednesday or Thursday or Friday and sometimes even on Sunday afternoon, they'll say, well, it was good. Great sermon, Pastor. Okay, what was it about? Jesus. But what else? And they don't remember. Now I know you remember every sermon Pastor Proctor has preached. But I promise you, I know for myself, 
It's often very difficult to remember the messages that we hear. We hope they will move us toward God. That something will be different in our life. That we will be inspired and changed. But today I offer you the title of this sermon is simply this, one, one, one. In Spanish, uno, uno, uno. Or un siente once. One, one, one. When we get in crisis in our life, when we face challenge in our life, we can call on somebody greater than 911. We can call on somebody who will stick closer than a brother. We can call on somebody that will be there no matter what happens in our life. He will be with us. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the everlasting he is the Alpha and the Omega, the wheel within the wheel, the Rose of Sharon, the Lily of the Valley. He is our center freer. He is our life giver. He is our soon coming King. He is our resurrection. He is our hope. He is our life. He is our peace. His name is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So I encourage you today, when you're in crisis, yes, call 911. We need the health professionals in our life. We need those services. But there is somebody that we must also call. And perhaps in the process, his name is Jesus Christ. He will not only heal your body, touch you in the situation, give you peace in the midst of the storm. He will heal relationships. He is our source in our life. He is our hope. And he is the one on whom we can call. Amen. In this passage of Scripture, we find the disciples are with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been crucified. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He is up. He is a resurrected body at this moment. He has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And He is walking with these disciples, talking with them. He is about to go to heaven to be with the Father. He said in John, I will go and prepare a place for you that you can come and be with me. I must go to my Father's house. But the disciples seem to have a hard-headed uh, approach of understanding what Jesus would say often in their journey. When he talked about being offered up, they really didn't get it. When he talked about that he must go away, they really didn't get it. They did not understand these things. Until they happen. Now we look backward. We have the, the pleasure and the, the absolute opportunity and the convenience of looking back in history. But they were living it out. Much like we do today. We have to trust God and walk by faith. We don't know necessarily where He leads us. But we trust on Him to lead us there. We know that we must trust Him to keep us and guard us and take care of us. Yet we wonder and question in our mind. They were just like we are and we were just like they are. Human beings, these disciples. And Jesus has gathered them there and He's giving them instructions. Now remember, some of them, when Jesus was crucified and buried, they went back to pick up their nets and go back to their old job. And then the third day came, and Peter and John went to the tomb. They ran to that tomb, and they found that there was nobody there because Jesus Christ had resurrected. Yes. They were giving, Jesus was giving the disciples instructions about what to do. And he tells them, you're going to go in Jerusalem and you're going to wait for me. I'm going to send you a comforter. In this scripture, he says, after the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses. Now in the church, in the Pentecostal church, we have oftentimes worshipped and experienced. I don't want to offend anybody or frustrate anybody today, but I'll just tell you the reality, the truth. Can I just be straight with you? Amen. God did not call us to worship worship. He called us to worship Him. Amen. And as Pentecostals, I remember growing up in a Pentecostal church. And when we had a really great service and there was a message in tongues and there was this Holy Spirit moment and people would pray at the altar and people would shout and sing. We would walk out of church and we would hear things like, we really had church today. I even remember 
remember as a young boy when we would go out of church and there was such a move of God that there was no preaching. We would say, we really, really had church today because there was no preaching. <laughs> now, if you grew up in a Pentecostal church, you know what I'm saying. And here's the point. God did not call us to worship Pentecost. He called us to be empowered through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the experience is good. And the worship is great. And the experience in the altar is powerful. But if we don't do anything with it, then we are worthless. Amen. Because the whole point is, you shall receive power to be my Witnesses. Yes. And so if all we do is come and kumbaya in the sanctuary and we never go out into the streets, into the community, into the culture and communicate Jesus Christ and help people to be saved and set free and transformed, then we fail. Yes. And the reality is that God has called us to go into the world, to transform the world and bring the light of the world into the darkness of the world in order that the world might be saved and set free in the name and the power of Jesus Christ and they would experience what we would experience and we would literally, as Jude says, snatch them out of the fire and we would absolutely empty hell and fill heaven by finding them before they get there. They're on a road and we intervene in that in the power of Jesus' name. Yeah, man. Oh, give me yeah. praise. Yeah. And so here are these disciples, and they're staring up into heaven as Jesus says. And they're looking in the clouds. These are some of the same guys that had gone back and picked up their nets and started fishing after he was crucified, almost thinking, well, it's over. Our time with him is over, and therefore I'm going to go back and do what I used to do and be who I used to be. And I have a good run. It's been a good three years, but it's done. And now they're staring up into the clouds, and there's these angels, these messengers, and they, they, they're there all of a sudden. And they say to them, what are you doing? What are you looking at? Why stand you here looking up into the clouds? Don't you know? The same Jesus that left is coming again in the same way he left. He's coming back. And it's time, it's almost as if they're saying, stop staring in the clouds. Go to work. He called you to work. Go and understand he will be with you. Why stand you here looking up in the clouds? This Jesus Christ. He's the same. He is the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is still the same. Matthew represents Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of all messianic hopes and expectations. Mark represents Jesus as the Redeemer through a concise history of redemption accomplished through the atoning work of Christ. Mark substantiates the messianic claims of Jesus by emphasizing Jesus Christ's authority as a teacher, his authority over Satan and unclean spirits, his authority over sin and the Sabbath, over nature, disease, and death. Luke represents Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the ideal man, the perfect Savior of imperfect man. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the exalted Lord. Jesus is the friend of of sinners. John presents Jesus as the only begotten Son of God that became flesh, the incarnate, who became flesh and dwelt among us. For John, Jesus' humanity meant two things. As the Lamb of God, He procured or purchased the redemption of humanity. Let me just pause there for a moment. There is no name under heaven by which a man might be saved. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Two, through His life and ministry, He revealed the Father. Christ consistently pointed beyond Himself to the Father who had sent Him and whom He sought to glorify. This book of Acts, this book of action is the story of the disciples receiving what Jesus Christ received in order to do what Jesus Christ did. The book of Acts is the church in action, empowered by the redemptive anointing of Jesus Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This Jesus Christ, 
This Jesus Christ of Acts and the Gospel. He is not dead. He is alive. He is not asleep. He didn't clock out. He didn't punch out. He didn't quit. He is still the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is still the same. And you can call on Jesus any day, any night, any time. Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is the one who saves us and sets us free. There is no Buddha in some Chinese restaurant somewhere that can get up and walk across the room and save you. There's no fat belly Buddha that can heal you. There's no fat belly Buddha that can give you eternity. There is no prophet of Allah named Muhammad that can point you to heaven and get you there. There is no way that any Hindu God fashioned by the hands of man will help you do one thing in your life. There is no new age avatar. There is no new age presence or crystal or meditation that can take you from hell to heaven. But there is one man. His name is Jesus Christ. He is a friend of sinners. He is the Savior. He is the Lord. He is the Master. He is the one that redeems us and sets us free. His name is Jesus. Amen. Praise be to God. He will tell you in culture, don't mention his name. They'll say, don't pray in his name. Don't talk in his name. Don't speak about his name. You can talk about Hindu gods. You can talk about Muhammad. You can talk about Muhammad's God, Allah. You can talk about the Buddhas. You can talk about every new age thing going. But don't mention the name of Jesus Christ. But I've got news for you. Jesus Christ is the one and only. He alone is the center freer. He is the one that went into the grave and kicked it open three days later. And he's the one that made a way for us. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is our Savior. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ is our sanctifier. What does that mean, preacher? It is an old term, perhaps, that we used to talk about more in the holiness Pentecostal movement. But the reality is for me, the sanctification means I don't act like I used to act. I don't talk like I could talk or would talk if I didn't know Jesus. I don't walk like I would walk if I did not know Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that every day I walk with Him, I am not like I once was, not like I could be, but I'm headed to heaven on a path where I'm becoming more like Jesus Christ, less of me and more of Him. Jesus Christ is our sanctifier. Jesus Christ is our healer. Yes. yes. Amen. Well, that's a controversial statement right there. I tell you what, I get so mad at the devil. I get so angry at all the curses of this world and the mess we live in. And knowing that this body is not a perpetual motion machine. Once breath hits this body and every baby that's born, the clock starts ticking. Yes. We're all born and then we die. Yes. Yes. That's a hard sermon on Sunday. <laughs> You're supposed to talk about how great everything will be. There's no way to understand God's greatness or His sovereignty. But one thing we know is that Jesus Christ does heal. Now you say, well, he doesn't heal me for everything. He didn't heal everybody. I understand that. But I absolutely believe that he is healer. Amen. Sure, in the early service, I've had asthma all my life. I remember as a little boy, maybe five, six, seven years old, couldn't get enough breath in my body to cry out to my mother and dad. Help me! I can't breathe. I was a skinny little guy. I may not look like that now. But I remember looking. I had this, this hole, this cave-in part of my chest. Trying to breathe. Been prayed for. Tried every remedy possible. People would say, well, try this. Try that. Try this. Oh, yes. And still a struggle. Asthma still there. But I believe that Jesus is my healer. Why do I say that? Because I'm not going to tell you that everybody gets healed from everything. But I absolutely believe that when we pray for people and we call the elders of the church, we can pray and believe for the power of healing. 
Yes. A few years ago, well, almost 30 years ago, 27, 28 years ago, I was pastoring a church, Cheryl and I, in Chicago. And I remember this Sunday, I think there were 17 people in church, and I was ready to throw in the towel, turn in my resignation, and just give up. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and I asked the ushers to come forward, and Joe came forward, and I remember Brother Buck came forward, and he was standing over here to my right. Your left. And in that church, I began to pray. And we, they, were, they were coming to take receive the offering. And as I prayed, I heard this thud. And I looked up and Buck was laid, laid out on the floor. And Sister Irina, who was over here, she was a registered nurse. She got up, came over to Buck. She's kneeled down beside him looking for his vital signs, looked up to me, and she shook her head. What am I going to do? Here I am, this young 20-something preacher, Buck has just died in the church. His wife, Violet, got up. She was over here. And she began walking the floor. Now, that's a term, perhaps. But she was speaking in tongues, praying, and headed straight toward Buck. And I'm like, what do I do? Do I stop her? Do I let her go? Another person had come to me already, running down the stairs to the basement to call 911. Now, our church was about half a block to the next corner, and about a quarter of the block, as you turned right, there was the fire station. Right there. So, so Cheryl, not my wife Cheryl, but Cheryl called 911. It took about 20 minutes for the ambulance to go from that fire station, once they got the call, or the call to get there, and then to get in the truck, and then the drive. They didn't have enough, they didn't drive far enough for, you know, woo! No, it, it didn't even make it. It was like, whoop. <laughs> it was so close. They could have walked faster than they drove. In the interim, Sister Byron had come over there, and she got on the floor and laid her hands on her husband, praying in, the, in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost, and by the time the fire truck got there, Brother Buck was sitting up on the floor. Now, you say to me, well, he wasn't dead. He was knocked out. He's passed out. I don't know. But I can tell you this, I believe that Jesus Christ touched that man. And I believe that God intervened in that situation. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus Christ is our healer. I love to walk around and sing the song. Y'all know I don't sing, but I love to sing the song. You are the God. That he lifts me. You are the Lord, my healer. You heard my needs, my cry. You healed my disease. You are the Lord, my healer. And here's the reality the minute we die, we're absent from this body. And we're present with the Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is our healer. And the greatest healing he ever did was not from disease or sickness or death. But it was the healing that he provided in the atonement when he died on the cross. And he resurrected on the third day. In all those other gods that we talk about, people worship. There's only one that got up on the third day. Yes. And his Amen. name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Without the resurrection, the cross has no power. Yes. But with the resurrection, the cross is complete. Yes. Jesus is our healer. He is our healer. Jesus Christ is our Holy Spirit baptizer. Yes. He's the one that fills us with his power to do his work. He's the one that can give us the, the absolute victorious power to go out and preach and communicate his gospel. Yes. Yes. Amen. And finally, Jesus Christ. He is our soon coming King. King. Oh, praise praise the Lord. Now people like to theologize and philosophize. And they'll say, well, you know, rapture is not in the Bible. It's not a Greek word or a Hebrew word. It wasn't even there. I said, well, that's fine. Because right here in this scripture, it tells me 
This same Jesus that healed blind Bartimaeus. This same Jesus that raised up Jairus' daughter. This same Jesus that called Lazarus out of the grave. This same Jesus that turned water into wine. This same Jesus Christ that got up out of the grave himself and ascended into heaven is coming back again in like manner. Yes. He will come back yes. soon. Jesus Christ, no matter what situation you face, no matter what difficulty you're in or ever experience, just call on Jesus. Amen. And so when you're walking down the road or driving down the road or wherever you're at this week, remember, if you're in crisis and trouble, yes. remember that. One, one, one. Acts 1, verse 11. Jesus Christ is the same. He ascended. He's coming back. He is our Savior. He's our Lord. He doesn't change.